My question to the panel and starting with Simone is what makes Australia such a fertile place for new payment technologies and how are fintechs taking advantage of that in Australia currently? Look, it's a really interesting time in Australia and we're seeing a lot of that coming through at Fintech Australia level and all the way down through to um, consumer level. I think there's a lot of people aware of it. So representing on this panel, we've got um, people from the buy now, pay later sector. We've got people from the cross-border payment sector, which is indicative of the movement that we're seeing in those two niches of the payment market. But we're also seeing innovation all the way through the pause. We're seeing more players coming into that space, which traditionally has had high barriers. Um, and we're seeing innovation being driven, not just from new FinTech entrants, but also from incumbent financial institutions. I think that's got a lot to do with the fact that we are at a time where we're seeing some big and fundamental changes to the landscape. So the MPPA, the consumer data right, which I think we'll talk about later, will have some impact in payment space. Um, and a, more of an awareness and an, a, a willingness to adopt new payment types at consumer level is really driving us forward. So it's an exciting time um, and there's a lot of different innovation happening across the wide breadth of the payment sector itself. Thanks, Simone. Um, Damien, same question to, to you and I guess particularly from a BNPL perspective, buy now, pay later. Um, what, what's driving fintech innovation in payments in Australia? Yeah, it's a good question. And I think one of the things that, you know, we notice is the the kind of savvy consumer base um, in Australia and also kind of what I would call the socioeconomic status of young people and, you know, the average Australians. Um, you know, when we look at prevalence of iPhones and smartphones in Australia, they extend far beyond people who are kind of on the wealthy end. It's something that is accessible to to, to, to ordinary people. Um, and I think this kind of adoption piece is something that Australia is, is, is famous for. Um, you know, at my time at Google and at Uber before that, trialling things in Australia first uh, would be something that American companies thought of because of the fact that there is um, this idea around not only wide acceptance, but wide use of uh, technology um, in, in the economy. Um, for us, um, yeah, look, I mean, we're proud of the fact that not only did we start a segment in Australia, it's now kind of something that has proliferated around the around the world. Um, and we've also got inward investment, you know, so now Australia and the ASX have effectively become a bit of a hub for the, the buy now, pay later sector. Cezil being a US company listing in Australia, um, you know, Israeli companies listing in Australia because that it's that market that understands how um, these kind of payment products work. So there, there are kind of secondary effects um, that, that, we're, that we're seeing. Um, but, you know, and, and, you know, also from a competitive perspective, companies in the US, UK and, and Europe doing similar things to us um, and, and um, also launching in Australia. Thanks. Thanks, Damien. So a sort of fertile ground for, for testing that's being added to all the time and a willing consumer base that, that wants to try new, new products. Um, Nathan, would you would you echo that sentiment? Yeah, definitely echo that sentiment. Um, I think, you know, in, if we look at, I guess, the rise of Afterpay, Damien's probably going to test that, but PayPal had a buy now, pay later product that they tried to launch or thought about launching in, um, or they launched in the US in 2012. They thought about launching it in Australia around the same time as Afterpay was launching. I was fortunate to be working at eBay, so I sort of heard, you know, rumours through the corridors of the fact that they were thinking of opening it here. And they decided not to, and that was, uh, you know, an opportunity that they obviously missed um, and didn't manage to capitalise on because they didn't recognise the fact that, you know, uh, the, the Australian consumer was really looking for digitised products. Um, one of the other things that I also find interest, interesting is also probably the um, alignment of cashless transport with adoption of technology. So if you look at the UK, they've had um, Octopus, Octopus, no, that's uh, Hong Kong, um, I can't remember what they're called in the in the UK anyway, but they've had the cashless transport for you know since two thousand and four, two thousand and five, and their um, ability to adopt digital payment technology has been you know sort of first to the market in a lot of cases. Australia, we've rolled that out sort of very quickly, well not quickly, but eventually since two thousand and seventeen, two thousand and eighteen, but earlier in some cities. And as that sort of trend to cashless moves, the whole population is forced to adopt it. So therefore, they're more willing to to shift to to cashless environments. And then if we look at, say, cash use now in sort of 2019, 
it's around 27% compared to say around 69% in 2017. So that's really shifted the adoption of, of, of cashless in society, which makes people more willing to, to move to sort of digital technologies um, and accept those and, and always now starting to look for the next thing. So what's next? You know, as soon as um, Afterpay, Klarna, there's so many buy now, pay later options, but then everything is also about that user experience, making it more easy to use. You've got um, cross-border payments with like Revolut as well for individuals um, that are just, you know, firing people up with um, great UX. Thanks, thanks, Nathan. And I'd, I'd echo that point about transit as a as a great accelerant um, here. Um, you know, you saw it in London, as you say, with the move to to contactless. I think here you're starting to see it as an accelerant as people use their own debit or credit cards um, as an accelerant towards mobile. And and we, we'll talk later maybe about uh, how COVID could actually be another accelerant in in that in that way as well. Um, okay, so we've mentioned open data a, a couple of times, and 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 I guess it's and particularly open banking is a is a focus globally. Um, as Simon mentioned um, earlier in Australia, we we have a, a government mandated consumer data right, um, and that will give consumers greater access to and and control over their data um, across the whole digital economy, not not just in banking. So the question there, I guess, is is how will open data enable fintech innovation in, in payments moving forward. And, and John, I might might just start with you from a from a data perspective at, at, at Plaid. I think fundamentally, uh, when you're thinking about a payment, it, it really is a flow of information from one place to another. Uh, and I think the, the critical thing that Australia is in the process of doing is in recognizing that that core information and and information about the consumer and their finances that powers a number of uh, payment solutions is something that should be in the control of the consumer. And once you think about the consumer as sort of the hub of a, a variety of financial networks, I think what you what you fundamentally do is you're no longer thinking about a series of financial firms that are silos of information that need to be very sort of thoughtful in how they connect with each other. It's the consumer connecting to a whole variety of financial services companies and moving their data, including payments and uh, other things like account information, information on their income, uh, across that network to whoever can provide them the service that meets their needs the most. Um, and that really creates the opportunity for it to not just be uh, banks and investment advisors, sort of the traditional places that have held consumer data, uh, but also new incumbent, uh, new challengers to that sort of incumbent players who have a specific use case like buy now, pay, pay later or cross border pay that they can deliver better and can make that approach directly to the consumer and say, with your information, I will offer you a service that's better than the service you're getting right now, does something that you haven't been able to do before, or does something that you have been able to do, but does it cheaper, more efficiently, with a better UX or better side benefits to it. Um, and Australia in pushing forward on that has, has frankly, I think, set it up to be broader and stronger as a consumer data right than the other countries who have dipped their toes into open banking so far by making it clear not only is this a right that sort of starts in financial services but it's one that's going to expand out which really lets the innovators see a clear roadmap that an investment here in Australia is one where the number of options I'm going to have to offer creative solutions is just going to expand as that data right expands uh, with the consumer. So I would see that as the main driver of innovation is that commitment to the consumer as the core holder of the data and also a, a right that's gonna continuously expand and offer new opportunities for consumers to use that data in creative ways in the payment space. Thank, thanks, John. I'd, I'd certainly agree with that. The, the whole uh, basis of the consumer data right or CDR is, is the consumer being at the centre and, and um, it's their data. Uh, and um, important to mention that um, on the 1st of July, the, the, the first phase of that goes live with, uh, with financial services data. But as, you, as you're hinting at there, uh, there's already work un, underway on, on energy, for example, as the second sector. So that's really important. Uh, Simone, um, your, your thoughts on the CDR and the innovation it'll bring? 
I'm actually really excited to see the changes that come about from the 1st of July. Um, from a, a purely payments perspective, um, I think I think we have a long way to go between the understanding of what's possible, um, you know, in the UK, for example, which is structured slightly differently, as John mentioned, to how we're designing those uh, right access or payment initiation um, accesses on our open data in Australia. Um, there's a push at the moment to look more closely at right access. When we go live in July, it will all be read only. Um, and I think that by just focusing on consumer data right in a in a vacuum, we forget about the NPP that's actually developing the mandated payment service, which will be a proxy for right access on the on the um, on the open banking rails. It will be a more secure, safer one, and it will put the consumer in the driving spot from both the acceptance of a payment mandate to cancellation. Um, now that's got a really big impact when you look at things like scheduled payments or recurring payments, being able to shift that uh, mentality from, you know what, the consumer can cancel easily, can make adjustments, can see everything that's happening in their financial environment in the one place. I think that that's going to have a bigger effect because it is a payment rail and a right and a permission and all that other stuff all wrapped up into the one ball essentially as opposed to payment initiation right access which would then rely on a third party payment rail attached to it to actually initiate a payment so um, i'm excited to see how cdr changes how we interact with our financial environments as consumers um, but i think that the payment specific focus needs a little bit more work and a little bit more understanding before we're at the point where we're comfortable to say actually we don't need right access but we do need right access yeah, re really well put, um, Simone. And, and there's a consultation underway at the moment on um, on right access uh, to the CDR, and it certainly makes reference to the new payments platform, which I think is really really positive. To your point, as a as a way of enabling that, and and indeed to um, to concepts like digital identity, which we might come on to uh, later, and existing frameworks for for, for that as well. Um, okay, D Damien, over to you and and your thoughts on on uh, open data. Yeah, I just thought I would talk about kind of you know what one of the benefits for for customers when 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 they're using a system like Afterpay. Right right now, we as an organisation have opted not to conduct credit checks nor report into credit files. Um, you know, we believe it's a bit of an antiquated system in in some ways, and also not as useful for a younger demographic. So. You know, younger people haven't built up a credit file, so there's not much on there. It's less useful to us as a data point. That's the first thing. Secondly, we believe, you know, and we see that we're a much safer type of product than a lot of the other, what I would call, you know, high interest credit products out there. So even if someone had a bad experience on a 20%, 25% credit card or a payday loan, it doesn't necessarily mean that they would perform badly on a system that is free, that is about instalments, that is about connecting your debit card to the payment system. Um, so when we think about, you know, the, the data from a consumer perspective that they could share with us in relation to, you know, their kind of income levels on an automated way, it kind of helps our decision making as well as kind of benefits a customer in relation to how much they how much limits they should have on Afterpay, how little, you know, whether we should actually block the account at a certain point because we don't believe they have the funds to, to pay for something. Um, so, that, you know, we, are, we do think about it from a consumer protection perspective and we, we see it as what I would call an important innovation that will be a step change compared to something like credit checks. It's, it's a really good point that the, the security mechanisms that go with an established consumer data right as those, you know, per the one that we're building in Australia compared to other ways of, of getting data. Uh, Nathan, any thoughts on the, on the CDR from your perspective? Yeah, look, I think if anything, it might also help, and John sort of alluded to this earlier, but it might also help push UX along even further. And ultimately, you know, what's going to, it gives the customer choice, right? So well, they're going to choose whatever's going to solve their problem, but then also whatever has the sexiest and the easiest use to be able to do that. So if you can pick up an app and you can, you know, Lemonade's probably a good example out of the US in terms of rental insurance. You know, it's really easy to now get rental insurance there. So they've got a huge adoption rate, especially amongst a younger audience because it's very, very simple to use. Um, the easier the product is to use, the less clicks is it's involved, 
the sexier the interface and the more data that it can provide in terms of analytics to give people that control over their information, that's what's going to shift and shape it. We've got the neobanks here in Australia, which are really sort of starting to, you know, offer those types of services, Judo from a bank, um, from a business perspective. Uh, they haven't got a business bank account yet, but they're offering, you know, business loans with, with some intuitive um, information. I know Doe um, has just listed and, and they're offering some, some really good UX in terms of giving people the control, uh, ability to be able to control their finances a lot more. So it's, it's whatever sort of um, products are going to be able to so, solve those issues. And ultimately, it's the consumer data right that's going to enable them to shift from one to the next one. So they're able to pick up their information, move that over. We saw a huge increase in competition around mortgages when in 2010 they dropped the fee. I mean, there's still obviously additional costs in terms of shifting from one mortgage to another. So just to clarify for our US friends in 2010, um, they were used to, prior to 2010, there was exorbitant exit fees involved with shifting your mortgage from one provider to another provider, and they eliminated that fee um, across the board. So it meant that as, an, as a consumer, you can now move from one mortgage um, provider to another one much more cost effectively. It's still not necessarily the easiest thing to do. But as a result, sort of in the past couple of years, we've seen a, a significant rise of smaller um, mortgage providers who have been able to grow. And now there's a couple of new ones that have launched in the past sort of 12 months as well, offering some different sort of, um, again, UX and solving sort of certain problems. So it'll be interesting to see where they go. And again, just harking back, it's that data right that ultimately is going to enable those shifts much more readily and much more quickly. Um, and if you if you don't have a, a sexy operating system, something that's attracting people, it's not something simple to use, um, and it's not solving the problem, then I think you're sort of dead in the water. Thanks, thanks, Nathan. Um, so a focus on consumer experience as well as as the consumer, and I think that's certainly been a learn learning from. The UK getting that focus on the consumer experience up front in the design of the consumer data right is really important. Uh, so, panel, we, we need to talk about COVID. Um, uh, from from our, our perspective, um, the, the interesting thing, I guess, from a payments perspective with, with COVID-19 is that it's accelerated some trends that we were already seeing in Australia. So, um, uh, it's driven an acceleration in, in still lower usage of, of cash and checks. Um, increased use of contactless payments, digital wallets and e-commerce, uh, and also increased use of what we've just been talking about in terms of open data, as well as uh, aligned to that um, digital identity verification and, and, um, and authentication. Um, so I guess the key question is, is which of these payment trends that we've seen uh, during COVID-19 are likely to persist longer term? Uh, and I might start with John there, just in terms of the, the data again that you're, you're seeing. Sure, uh, and I should say, you know, I think acceleration is the is the right frame for this. Although I think maybe that may even undersell it a little bit, Andy, because what we've seen is uh, massive acceleration, and it's really around everyone's digital strategy and a fundamental realization that um, in a world where literally your customer cannot come to a brick and mortar store to do business with you. If you don't have a digital strategy, you're dead in the water. Um, and fundamentally, to have a digital strategy, you need to have a data strategy. And, and that's where I see sort of that trend is not going to uh, stop. That's the accelerating trend is the rapid digitization and the necessity of real data interoperability across the ecosystem to support that um, is not going away. I, I mean, I will cross my fingers and hope that there's no one from the US government on uh, to hear me say it, but when when we passed a COVID uh, stimulus legislation and needed to make payments to uh, more than 100 million American consumers, it was a bit embarrassing in 2020 to realize that uh, a lot of what we were gonna be doing was printing physical checks and sending them to people uh, some of whom would not receive those checks until September, right? Which if you're trying to stimulate the economy in March is not a particularly good strategy. Um, and I think there's been a fundamental realization that some of the payments and other financial services infrastructure is still fundamentally built on that brick and mortar experience. Um, and that's going to shift as a necessity post COVID. The other thing I'll, I'll just, speak to, uh, and maybe Nathan can talk a little bit more about it on the UX side is, there's also a consumer expectation that's gonna shift, which is if during COVID and during the lockdown, 
your experience as a consumer has been with certain providers, I got my same level of service uh, because they are fully digitized. You're not going to be willing to go back to someone who's offering you a lower level of service or a worse UX or something that looks like, you know, it was a website built in 2005 and then put on a mobile phone in 2015 and is limping along from there. Um, we've been in this long enough that consumer expectations are going to anchor to who are the highest performing service providers, who could I rely on when uh, the rest of the world sort of broke down in the face of this. That's who I want to keep doing business with, and that's now my minimum expectation for what I expect from a financial services provider. Thank, thanks, John. So a, a fairly radical, radical change, and um, but built around um, consumer experience. And I guess the message that the that the digital economy is the economy um, moving forward. Um, that Damien, from a um, from a person to person P two P payment perspective. Uh, what's likely to be sticky there? It's a, it's a really good question. And, you know, as an online based company, we do have in store in Australia. Um, but as an online based company, like what are the settings that we saw in COVID? We saw, you know, people being mandated to stay at home. Um, that were, there were stimulus payments. So, you know, some of the huge trends we saw was actually, a, you know, not only a shift to online, but um, disposable income being used in a way to purchase things that people wanted because they weren't spending money kind of in, in, in other places, restaurants, etc. cetera. Um, but the other thing that was very noticeable for us was um, different age demographics finding about new technology because, you know, someone that would have gone to an in-store environment has now been forced to think about online more and therefore have learned about things like Afterpay and other payment products um, while they're kind of in the in-home environment. So we believe that there has been customer acquisitions there that will last that wouldn't have if we didn't have um, the, the COVID period. Uh, the other trend that is very clear for us is another shift or another dramatic shift towards debit card usage over credit cards. Um, we've now seen um, some very, very significant data from Alpha Beta and the credit bureau Ilion to show that credit card usage during the period took quite a dive, not as much as physical cash, but certainly, certainly down with, with about a 20% increase in um, the usage of buy now, pay later. Um, we even see in our own system that customers opt to use uh, a debit card 80 to 90% of the time over a credit card to make their installment payments. And if, if we've seen anything happen, it's that that has become more acute during this period. And for us, there is what I would call similarities and uh, very similar trends to what happened during the GFC. Afterpay was kind of born out of the GFC where, you know, risky credit was going out. It wasn't something that was attractive to a new generation of people that saw their parents, you know, in debt or uh, with unmanageable credit products. Um, we're kind of seeing that again. We're seeing it with certainly the Gen Z generation, but also amongst others, people going, how do I ensure that I am budgeting properly during a period where money coming in is not as certain as it used to be? And, and we do think that, you know, like the GFC, there will be ongoing trends in relation to people thinking about how they, they spend their money in a more savvy way or, or manage their cash flow. And, you know, we believe the, the statistics coming out of the RBA and Ilion and others of credit card usage going down will, will continue. Yeah, so a real, a real focus on managing spending, which of course is another potential innovation and use case for um, open data as well um, there and, and, and economy wide, not just in financial services. And I'd certainly okay. echo the point about um, about other demographics, you know, you've seen um, older people um, use digital payments for the first time because it's been a necessity. And again, that's that's likely to be sticky. Um, th thanks, Damien. Um, Simone, just from a, a, a more corporate world B2B perspective, what, what trends are you seeing that are likely to persist? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I've been asked a couple of times over this period, oh, you know, surely this will be the end of recurring payments. <laughs> I kind of why why would that be the case what we've actually found is that 
um, the businesses who directly use our systems have actually started using the wide functionality that they might not have needed to use before. So things like individually managing payment agreements, putting in holds, putting in adjustments, things that they're able to do without having to directly make a phone call or send an email because the system does it for them. It's all around communication between the payer and the payee and maintaining that communication in the face of changes so that each party has their own um, preferences heard and met. Um, and we've found that that's actually been a really interesting thing to watch. We were preparing for some uh, avalanche of support calls from both the, the payer and the, the payee perspective, but the system looked after it. And I think that in the face of that, it really shows that legacy systems that we've been relying on for a long time, not just in um, you know, direct debit or recurring payment land, but across the board, they're fine as long as the situation that created the legacy is still true. And COVID really made sure that a lot of those legacy environments no longer exist. So those legacy systems are really shown for being um, outdated and, put, and not fit for purpose any longer. So I think that from a B2B perspective, there's going to be a higher demand for services that are automated, but that do provide a more personalised service between the business and their customer, whoever that might be. So that's a really interesting thing um, that speaks back up the chain, back up through banking, back up through third party payment providers to aggregators. How do we provide those services to allow businesses to make use of those new demands from consumers? Thanks. Thanks, Simone. Um, that's fascinating. Nathan, um, would you echo that from a from a B2B perspective as well and, and particularly thinking cross border? Yeah, from a B2B perspective, I definitely echo what Simone said. Um, you know, I think in the last sort of three to four months, we've definitely seen a huge acceleration in terms of where, you know, of, of the entire economy or just, you know, tech technology in general and the consumer expectations. If we look at the US, for example, e-commerce, just that specific vertical alone, it took 10 years for e-commerce in the US to go from 6% to 16% of total retail volume. In the last eight weeks, it's now gone from 16 to 27%. Like that jump alone, that huge surge of demand for people moving online has just seen a total shift in thinking and that's echoed across all industries. You know, people haven't been interacting as much and that's globally, you know, we look at uh, banking in, uh, or digital banking, uh, on, you know, um, as a, from a global perspective as well. The US at January, 2019 was sitting under 50%. So it was around 40% of all banking in the US was at um, 48%. Whereas if you look in other markets, it was much higher. So Thailand led the world at 78 or 79%, something along those lines, Thailand. You know, you had countries like Vietnam, Colombia, all much higher than, than say the US. And even Australia was tracking around the sort of 60, 65%. But that's increasingly shifted in the last, you know, three to four months. You know, you walk past the bank now and there's not that many people in there. People aren't using ATMs to take cash out anymore. I like can't think of the last time I took cash out. You know, I echo what I said earlier around, um, transport systems you know in the us i think it's only something like 20 or 30 you know major cities that have got um cashless uh transport and and that that needs to that'll shift and once that shifts it starts to change the general population and and covid um has has only really increased that the capacity for that to occur um when i when i look at cross border as well specifically you asked about cross border from a b2b perspective you know there's definitely consumers in markets that want to buy locally. And that's increased. Uh, we've seen that increase as well across, um, across the world. But we've also seen an increase in people wanting to buy items online and will buy from global suppliers. Um, and we've also seen a significant shift in terms of um, businesses looking to uh, diversify their supply base. So typically a business would have bought 95 to 100% of their products out of China manufacturing. And that's starting to shift because of what's just occurred in the last you know, three months with COVID. They were the first ones to go under and there was a lot of challenges um, with people being able to get supply out of China earlier in the year. And now with the trade wars that are going on and that, that sort of unsettling a lot of businesses, they're starting to seek other sources um, to be able to manufacture their goods, which is, which is a good thing, sort of, you know, not, you don't always put your, put your eggs in the one basket. Um, so there's definitely uh, that shift, which is occurring from a B2B lens. We're seeing a huge increase in cross-border payments because of that into new new markets, which is which is quite exciting as well. Um, and then we're also seeing a lot of people who are searching for products, if they're consumers who are searching for products, 
both locally, but if they're looking globally, they're looking from other regions and they're looking for sort of, um, you know, there's the essential items, obviously, which is more local, but then more niche products, which we're seeing a bit of an increase in as well. So I think if anything, the COVID, you know, COVID pandemic has definitely um, accelerated that transition um, completely. Excellent. Th thanks, Nathan. So I really, I really, again, that, that point about quite radical change and radical acceleration. Um, so I might just ask each of the panelists for a for a final final thought. I guess what I've what I've heard overall is is a, a really positive, exciting um, opportunity for for fintechs in Australia and and especially in the in the payment space and and um, and aided by uh, open data and and actually pretty radically accelerated by by COVID nineteen and some of the consumer expectation and uh, and experience that goes with that. Um, so just just um, seek your you know final a final thought. Um, I might start with with you, John, if that's okay. Sure. I, I mean, one thought that has occurred to me over the course of this conversation so far is just the remembering the truth that digital innovations tend to stack on top of each other, um, and that the more of those innovations there are, the greater possibility there are for more innovations and things we haven't thought of yet. And with Australia in particular, having established the CDR and established so many existing innovations in digital payments, uh, I really do see it as uh, the pie gets bigger and bigger. And uh, every time you make the pie bigger, the next increase is going to be that much more dramatic because you've got such a solid base to build on. Um, and we're really gonna see things coming out of it that no one necessarily conceived of five years ago or even this year uh, because of that uh, resonance that's built into the system as more and more things digitize and are supported by policies that s allow and even encourage some of that innovation. It's it's a really good point. I mean, we, we, we often talk about payments being a network business, but actually the, the wider digital economy is, and, and, and that's the opportunity here, isn't it, to, for different players to play a different role, but, but um, work in partnership to, to, to help grow that. Um, Damon, your, your thoughts? Look, it's similar, building on John's point, uh, you know, from our perspective, the innovation will be in the merging of different technologies. This idea that it's only fintech or only payments is probably not um, a sustainable business model. Most of our retailers don't see Afterpay as a payment option, but as a marketing tool, because at the end of the day, it is something they know a certain customer base likes. They see referrals from our app to their um, to their site. They know that offering this tool means that people will make the decision to purchase because they can purchase it over time. Um, a lot of our customers see us as budgeting a budgeting tool more than a payments. Um, application. Um, you know, right now, Steve Madden in the US will say that he's receiving more referrals uh, to his website on Afterpay than Instagram. So there is a kind of what I would call a merging of marketing and other kind of what I would call tools in the space that I, that, that I think will, will be the next chapter for, for the industry. It's a really good point. It certainly resonates with the earlier comment about um, payments just being a flow of data as well, right? That, that actually, um, it, it's uh, it, it's probably less meaningful to talk about payments and, to, and more meaningful to talk about uh, wider provision of that um, customer experience through through a variety of technology. Uh, Simone, your 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 thought. Look, I I echo uh, what both um, John and Damien said. We have such a cohort of of um, fintechs and individuals in Australia who are motivated not just to uh, put a new product into the market, but have an effect on the underlying policy and regulation that supports the adoption of that product. And that's a really powerful thing because we're not just changing the sector one product at a time. We're changing the whole framework that that we operate in, um, and I'm excited about that because. I really look forward to a day where the things that we're now pushing forward as these new and innovative and changing expectations and offering more consumer um, oversight and power become the accepted standard. And we're not talking about them anymore because we're talking about the next thing that we can now do with those accepted things. Um, talking about different ages adopting technology. My mother told me that she'd done digital banking for the first time last weekend and 
A, I was shocked that I'd never walked her through it before. And B, I asked, oh, is this something you're going to keep doing? Um, and she said, oh, yes, it was very easy. So, you know, that that took a long time to get my mother across the line. But I see that adoption um, cycle narrowing and becoming shorter and shorter as we move through the next rapid changes. Great, excellent. And just to just on your first point, we should have mentioned earlier, a big focus from government on fintech and regtech with the with the current consultation on on that as well, which is which is really positive, I think, in terms of building that that wider ecosystem that um, uh, that, that Damien talked to. Um, Nathan, um, your your final thoughts. Yeah, I think finally, I think at the moment, it's going to be critical to get business strategy right. Um, you know, sort of almost forgetting the digital side of things for me, it's, you know, the next, you know, six to 12 months is making sure that people are focusing really hard on innovating, but also shoring up their core, you know, it is your business the things that you would have focused on for the next five years you really need to be focusing on now because the consumer sentiment has just shifted digitally so much so a lot of businesses were thinking oh, okay in the next three to five years we're going to start to transition to you know these elements of digital digitization but that needs to be happening now because the the demand is there and and, and i think the the playing field has completely changed and there's a lot of the the um I guess the barrier to entry into a lot of industries has really been reduced. So it's very, very simple for a business in many different verticals, specifically payments, to enter into um, an industry and come up with something. You know, I talked about flashy UX. You know, Damien's probably seen that, that. You know, there's a lot of buy now, pay later businesses that have entered into the space and they've got some wonderful nifty UX. But the, the underlying infrastructure in terms of the difference between Afterpay and some of their competitors is very, very, very different. And so the offering that they, you know, the, the problems that they're solving, whilst they're the same, the offering to the business that they're working with or their partners and the consumer is something someone sometimes slightly different. But the consumer gets attracted by the sexy, shiny new thing, and that that can sometimes become a bit more of an issue. So it's important for businesses to really focus on their, you know, what's their strategy for the for the at the moment. What were they focusing on for the five years? Shore up their their core business and really focus on you know, making sure they're delivering the best experience, the best um, user experience as well, and also the, solving that problem more specifically for their consumers. And I think that's a really important thing that businesses need to be focusing on at the moment. Great, thanks, thanks, Nathan. So, so just to sum up there, a real focus on around, um, around da uh, data strategy and digital strategy um, on, on consumer experience and also on, on partnerships, which I think is, is one of the opportunities in this space. Um, so so uh, thank you to um, the excellent panel.